this underlying philosophical question that is kind of underpins everything we're saying, which is, do we think the human political economy is more like a garden or a watch? When there was a real boom in things being more quantified and researched and more evidence-based things, so you can think sort of late 1700s into 1800s, like an example I always think of was um, Florence Nightingale, um, who the, the lady of the lamp, the, the people think of her as a nurse, she was a, she was a statistician, that was ma her main uh, talent. And um, one thing, one of her key uh, statistical insights was during the Crimean War, she was the f one of the first people to take a look at the number of uh, British soldiers who were dying and say, most soldiers here are not actually dying either in uh, combat or from wounds acquired in combat. They're dying from diseases that they picked up because of the horrendous conditions on the camp. So I, I think there was this golden age where just the act of counting things and looking at things just made led to huge advances and you know that's that's obviously this is still true to a large extent of medicine and and i think at that point the the sort of the marginal benefit of anything being quantified and analyzed was pretty huge whereas these days you know we can discuss how much benefit are we now getting from you know all having our step count on our phones or, or tracking our sleep but also you know how much benefit does each additional little bit of government get going going online or, or being being quantified help? And I, I think I, I would certainly say like the that we're in diminishing returns territory. Like the each additional thing that's quantified these days, I think, is adding a lot less value than it used to. Um, but I think in a going off on a sort of I was going to say a parallel tangent, but the the data part of me is saying that's impossible. Um, <laughs> going to a parallel parallel line. Um, I think something um, that has that that is interesting is is society getting more data literate, more numerate. Again, to to come back to what I was saying, talking about earlier, like another example recently that I've found really good has been um, politicians, like senior senior politicians, conservative politicians in this instance, starting to make in in the UK making very doing very data driven reports about their hot topic issues so immigration for example and as um, Abby and Ken have both been talking about the conclusions that are drawn from those uh, those numbers are often differ wildly you know we can all look at the same numbers and this was true of covid as well it, people can look at the same um, model for what's happening to cases and come to completely different conclusions so i think the broader philosophical issue here is very much unsolved and we're still working through it but i just think the fact that more and more people whether it's people like like us in this room or people in government or people in business um, are concerned about data, working with data, able to you know, get as many hard facts out there as possible. I just think leads to better discourse and potentially better debates. Like you, we can think about the, um, the big to and fro about international student visas in the UK over the last couple of weeks, for example. And you could, we can argue all day about um, what should be done there, but I don't think many people would say decisions are being made because of a lack of data. I mean, there are, some data is still certainly lacking, but I think we're just in a, in a state where we ha we're having better conversations about this stuff. And I think on net, the impact of more, more things being quantified, even if the individual, individual thing being quantified isn't, isn't necessarily a game changer, the fact that we're just talking about this more and talking critically about data, I think is a good thing. Like people, um, so, done my parallel now a quick tangent um fun fact about charts so i make a lot of charts um I make a lot of data visualizations social there's been really good social science here that shows that charts are more persuasive than if you take the same information that's in a chart and write it as a paragraph that will change fewer people's minds than putting it in a chart now people often think this is because there's some magical power of, of drawing like a blue and a red line on a, on a piece of paper but i think it's more that when we go to school, we're taught not just how to read and write, but how to think critically about reading and writing, how to think what's the author's aim when they wrote this thing. Whereas when we go to school, the only time we see charts are in the results section. So we, we, you get to 18, 19, 20, 21, and you've learned that words, you've got to be careful about words, but charts, charts are always objective and factual, factually true. And you know, why would anyone talk about why, someone made, why or how someone made a chart? So I think in a sort of meta data sense, the, one thing that I think is getting better and I think will be better in 10 years or 20 years if the world is even more quantified is we'll just be having more, just, just better informed and more critical conversations about data and fewer people, it will be harder to, to hoodwink someone by 
saying, for example, my model says that this is the this is what will happen to um, tax receipts if we if we raise taxes. That's very optimistic in terms of the conversations around misinformation, isn't it? Ken, don't you think he's just being a bit sort of positive there? I'm a bit more worried than than he is. Juliet, I think your criticism, you should voice it rather than try to invoke me <laughs> to yeah. support it. It's you. Sure. Exactly. John, I think you've forgotten about AI and misinformation and social media and all our kids telling me complete rubbish that they read on something, TikTok, whatever. Um, I don't know, if, don't know if we need to bring your kids into Yeah, they're uh, here. They just, you know, yeah. they uh, take it all in as if it's well, truth. But social media is a great example, right? So in... and. Uh, Ken, I'm sure we'll have thoughts on this, but in the US over the last last few months, there's been this whole debate about why are Americans so down about the state of the US economy, which is outperforming pretty much any developed country and many and and many like smaller, fast growing countries. Um, and one of the theories is that part of what's happening is that it's if you if you say things are really bad and terrible on, on TikTok, you get loads more views, and so. In a, and this, this is interesting, right? Because in this instance, data works both ways. The reason um, the vibes on TikTok about the economy are so negative is because everyone has data on how well their videos perform and therefore learns that if I say, if I say everything's terrible, and this is true of newsrooms as well, you know, I know that if I say, if I write something saying, Tories, they're terrible. It will do better than if I write something saying oh, things are complicated. Um, so, so data can lead to negativity, but then at the same time, you combat the, this negativity about the U US economy, for example, by saying US economy is actually doing really well and poor Americans in particular are doing better and the income gap is shrinking. So I think it's, it's a perfect encapsulation of how data is. It's a bit like saying, um, I don't know, like, is the sun good or bad? Like it, it depends. What, what... Let me, okay. Yeah, let me, it's interesting. Let me bring up a... Um... I agree with that, a, a, an element to that. Daniel Kahneman, the late, um, sadly, uh, cognitive scientist, he said, he said something relevant to that once. He said, no one has ever made a decision based on a number, but on a story. I'll repeat that. No one ever made a decision based on a number, but a story. This is a guy who studied human decision-making all his life, and most importantly, how it's flawed, cognitive biases. And if he's right, if that's right, then I think those of us who care about data have to take it on the chin and realize there's a limitation to it, that it's actually the story that accompanies the number is where you win, not with the data itself. As you said, the data never speaks for itself. That's obvious to us. It's not obvious to most news editors on deadline. Uh, and of course, not to politicians and not to people. So if that's the case, then we need better stories. We need people who can ha hopefully harness the data to tell good stories. But we do know that in politics, often they don't even care about the data. They either use the wrong data or they misleadingly have it or they don't have any of it. And they just use the story. So there was a proposal by Dominic Cummings and, and Michael Gove in the Ditchley lecture. Uh, I mean, it was ostensibly Michael Gove, but we're pretty sure Dominic Cummings had quite a lot to do with the writing of it uh, about the transformation of the civil service. And it was basically the idea that you could run the state with real time data, right? That uh, you would create this machine like exercise in input and output mechanisms of information and feedback loops. And it would allow you this kind of synoptic understanding of how the political economy worked. Now, the thing that I uh, pointed out at the time was that that is the Soviet experiment with cybernetics in the 1960s, right? The idea that the political economy can be quantified like a machine and that you have this perfect uh, input and output mechanism and they called it perfect indirect centralization. And the Soviets gave it up as impossible because, I mean, it was for political reasons, but they also understood pretty quickly that they lacked the godlike foreknowledge that would allow them to cope with any kind of technological change but also they didn't they couldn't have the godlike position to know what the the social optimum was and if you didn't know what the social optimum was you couldn't calibrate the machine that it was heading in the right direction so it struck me as ironic that at the leading edge of neoliberal technology was a soviet experiment in computation in the 1960s that they gave up as excessively bureaucratic and that didn't strike <laughs> me as kind of progress um and and what that comes to is this underlying philosophical question that is kind of underpins everything we're saying, which is, do we think the human political economy is more like a garden or a watch? And if it's more like a garden, 
then government is an art. It's not a science, which is not to say we don't need really good information about what's going on in the garden. But in terms of can we close our understanding of what it needs and how to do it? No, it is a continuously open question. And what is fantastic about liberal democracy is that it, it is a system of adaptation based on new information. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. With a free trial, you can enjoy the full talk and thousands more. Thank you for being part of the conversation.